Hello, my name is Mr. Tom Froze, and these are my thoughts on illustration. Welcome to episode two of the podcast. Today, we're going to talk about five things you need to do to become an illustrator before even lifting a pencil. These are the things you can do right now without any fancy gear or new skills to help you get started on your illustration journey. If you like what you hear in today's episode, you can support me by following me and rating and reviewing this podcast wherever you happen to be listening from. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. You can also support me on Patreon, where you can get exclusive access to my live monthly drawing meetups called Draw With Me, plus all the past meetups as replays. Join today at patreon.com slash Tom Froze. In the very beginning, when you discover illustration and say, I want to do that, it's hard to know what to do from there. In the last episode, which you should definitely listen to first, I talked about that first spark moment and how at that time we want it before we truly understand it in the same way we can smell KFC before we pass the restaurant. I said that our first job was to understand what that is when we say, I want to do that and to look deeper into that initial desire so we can let that desire lead us through the long, long road ahead. In today's episode, I want to talk about next steps. What can we do to really begin from there? Between your spark moment and actually becoming an illustrator, there's a big gap, something that's hard to imagine ever crossing at the start. Not knowing how to begin is one of the biggest obstacles in our way on our journey. I believe that if we can just get past this inertia, we will be well on our way to bigger things. What keeps us from just starting something? Once we know we want to become illustrators, what stops us from just picking up a pencil and starting to draw or looking for an illustration program and just start learning? I believe it's the fear that we're starting out on the wrong foot. We're afraid that we'll spend too much time going down the wrong path and that we'll have to start all over again anyway. Or maybe we're overwhelmed by all the possibilities ahead of us. There seems to be infinite possible things we could do to get started. And we know that if we just chose one, we could start getting somewhere. But again, we're paralyzed by the sheer possibility. In the words of philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, we experience the dizziness of freedom the dizzying effect of looking into the boundlessness of one's own possibilities. In spite of this, many of us will bravely venture forward anyway, perhaps scouring the web, buying magazines, or picking up books at the library or bookstore about illustration. This is definitely what I did, and I think it's a good move. It's better to just move forward and make some mistakes than to stay motionless at the inspiration station. In the last episode, I told you about the time that I had to design a robot mouse that could navigate its way through a maze, and it did this by moving forward, bumping into walls and turning left or right to find the next opening. When we navigate the maze of becoming an illustrator, this is exactly what we have to do. Going down the wrong way is part of figuring out the right way. But if you're anything like me, rather than making me feel more like I'm on the inside, looking through design and illustration books or watching videos on YouTube can make me feel even more on the outside. It's inspiring to see all the different illustration examples, to see all the different styles and ways illustration can be used, but we also come across words like clients, portfolios, briefs, budgets, marketing, pricing, and things like that, and at the very beginning, these just don't make sense to us. We're not ready for them. Just as there are too many possibilities to fathom at the beginning, there are too many insider words and concepts that get in the way of truly beginning as beginners. 
Now, just a small trigger warning for anyone who squirms in their seats when they hear things about religion or God. I'm going to tell you a little anecdote from my childhood, and I was raised religiously. So here we go. As a kid in Sunday school, we would learn about how there is this big separation between us and God and how Jesus bridges the gap. There was always this illustration of a chasm, sort of like the Grand Canyon with a human figure on one side and the word God on the other. And of course, spanning the gap was a cross. The cross is how we get to God. It's an effective illustration. It gets the point across and it's memorable. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying an illustration career is God and somehow there's a savior that bridges the gap that separates us. But there is a sort of parallel here. There's a gap between us at the very beginning on the one side and actually getting started on the other. In one sense, the starting line isn't where we are at the beginning. It's over that seemingly unjumpable chasm. There is a gap between your first spark of inspiration and taking those first actual steps to become an illustrator. I call this the inspiration gap. It's not easy to get across if you don't find a bridge. Okay, so another trigger warning. I'm about to tell you an anecdote from um, older video games from my childhood from the like original NES. So here we go. Another image that comes to mind is in Super Mario Brothers when Mario has to jump over a chasm from one platform to the next. He'd either have to leap from block to block, separated by deadly gaps, making sure not to over or undershoot to get to the other side, or worse, there'd be these moving planks swinging from left to right, and you'd have to time your jumps just right to safely land on the plank and then get close enough to the other side to make the final jump without falling short. In the harder levels, like the boss ships at the end, the whole scene keeps moving forward and you have to do all this jumping over gaps and stuff without getting stuck or pushed over an edge by the game itself. That's probably how a lot of us feel when we're trying to figure this illustration career out, especially if you're feeling like time is against you. At the tender age of 22, when I had my first spark moment, I already felt like a late bloomer and that it was already too late. I know a lot of my over 30 listeners are laughing at young Tom right now, but I think we always feel like we're not as ahead as we'd like to be, no matter how old or young we are. Let's just set the time limit mentality aside for now. Yes, Time exists. It always has and it always will. Worrying about its passing is not going to make it stop. So take a deep breath and exhale. And let's get into the five steps that you can actually do right now to get to the other side of the inspiration gap. These are the things I had to sort of stumble upon in my own journey that hopefully by sharing with you, you can start doing more intentionally. If getting to the starting point of actually learning illustration is on the other side of a dangerous chasm, I want these tips to help you get there safely. These are the things you should definitely do, but don't cross them off your list. These are more like habits. These are things you should get used to doing regularly from henceforth and forevermore. They're definitely the most important things to do at the very beginning, but they never stop being necessary. So if that makes sense, let's get on with the tips. So the first thing you need to do is to find inspiration. Chances are you've probably already done this and that's what brought you here. We talked a lot about the initial spark of inspiration already, but now it's time to be more intentional. Finding inspiration is important because it's going to give you the closest thing to a vision of your future that you can get. Don't get me wrong, it's not like your future work is going to look anything like what you see in the very beginning, or at least it doesn't have to. But without something to set your sights on, it's going to be very hard to know 
where to go from here. Knowing what inspires you gives you something tangible to aspire to. It's sort of like the picture on the box of a model or a puzzle. You'll be able to put the pieces of your illustration journey together with more purpose and direction. There are two modes of finding inspiration, collecting and analyzing. In collecting mode, you are actively seeking out and gathering inspiration from various sources. In analyzing mode, you're looking more closely at what you've gathered. It doesn't need to be as formalized as it sounds. You just go out to a place like Pinterest or head out to a library or a bookshop and look for examples of illustration you love and then somehow start collecting it all in one place. Then at a certain point, you can look deeper into the work that excites you the most. That's what I mean by analyzing. What catches your eye the most? What makes you feel something different? Something that hits you on a different level, almost the same way you might feel about a favorite new song. I think Pinterest is the best place on the web to find inspiration. After this podcast, or even while listening, head over to Pinterest and look up illustration and then let yourself get lost in the inspiration that ensues. What images show up that catch your eye? Tap into one of these, pin it to a board called Illustration I Love, and then keep going. Maybe set a timer for 15 or 30 minutes if it helps. Later on, you can dig deeper by analyzing what you've collected. Is there a common thread to your collection? For instance, do a lot of the images seem to come from one era or decade, or is there a consistent color palette that comes up? Do you tend to pin images that have lots of lettering in them or characters that look a certain way? The important thing here is to be curious. When something lights up your soul, ask why that is. Find out why the image was made. Like, where did it get used? Was it on a book cover or a poster or a package? Was it in a magazine or from a corporate website? These are all questions we'll be digging deeper into in the next tips, but it all starts by finding inspiration on purpose. Before moving on to the next tip, if you want to get inspired from offline sources, if you can, I recommend going to a bookshop or library and looking up books on the topic of illustration. I'm not going to give you any recommendations for titles to look for. Just get out there and see what you stumble into. You never know what you're going to find. And that's part of the adventure and excitement of the whole thing. Personally, I've always loved going to thrift stores like Value Village and browsing old books or flipping through old record covers. There's a lot of crap to sift through, but every now and again, I find a really good gem and I either buy the thing or I just snap a picture. Another place to look for inspiration is in illustration annuals like Communication Arts and 3x3 Magazine. These are just two of the more reputable publications in the industry. If you want to see examples of the best work of today, according to industry professionals, juried illustration annuals are pretty much the gold standard. Oh, and a hot tip, don't just look at illustration annuals, be sure to check out design and typography annuals as well. These will give you some big clues about how the illustration you like ends up getting used and how you might want your own illustration to be used someday. We'll get more into this in the third tip, research the contexts. Now, just one extra little resource here that came up as I was writing this episode, go check out unsung heroes of illustration on Pete Beard's YouTube channel. Thank you so much to Lara Jackson for the tip. I'll leave a link to this in the show notes or video description. So the second tip here is to find your heroes. This is a logical next step after finding your inspiration. Heroes are people you look up to as examples of some kind of ideal. We tend to think of firefighters and soldiers as heroes since they exemplify bravery and selflessness and strength on a level we hope we ourselves could possess. 
Heroes are inspiring not because they're superhuman, but because they show what's possible for every human. Where it comes to our illustration heroes, we look for qualities we admire, such as talent, creativity, the kind of work they've done, the level of success they've achieved, the awards they've won, and things like that. We admire our illustration heroes for their style, for how their work makes us feel, for the way they can make us see the world differently, and sometimes we value them for being leaders and change makers in our culture. If you know me a little bit, you'll know who my hero of all time is, and that's the late American art director and graphic designer, Paul Rand, who was mostly active from the 1950s through 1990s. I can't remember the exact moment that I discovered him, but I think it was sometime during my time in art school as I was researching for assignments in the library. I know that I saw his work around a lot before then, but I specifically remember doing some research on logos and branding, and I ran into an essay of his called Logos, Flags, and Escutcheons. This was a short and spirited essay about the nature of logos. I'm just going to read a clip from the essay for you. So here I'm quoting. It reminds me of the Georgia chain gang, quipped an IBM executive when he first eyed the striped logo. How many exemplary works have gone down the drain because of such pedestrian fault finding? And how many good designs became bad designs as a consequence of mindless dabbling on the part of clients with little or no understanding of visual logic? I mean, come on, right? Paul preaches hard. As inexperienced as a designer that I was at the time, I already deeply related to the experience of showing what I thought was good work to clients or bosses only to have them squash it because they judged it too superficially. What's interesting for me is that Paul Rand became my hero because of his writing, not at first for his design. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, I think I appreciate his design so much more because of his writing. And I don't think it's an accident that alongside my visual disciplines, I'm also a writer. In fact, I often write in the same manner as Rand, reflecting from more personal experience more than anything else. Oh, and by the way, if you know anything about Paul Rand, you'll know that the title and cover art for this podcast is directly inspired by Paul Rand's work. What you can glean from this insight is that our heroes hit us in different and surprising ways and often tell us a lot about ourselves. There's no right or wrong way to have a creative hero. And perhaps your hero isn't an illustrator at all. Maybe they're a visual artist or a philosopher that somehow deeply influences how you approach your own creative work. Paul Rand himself quotes a lot of philosophers in his writing. So to find your heroes, it shouldn't be something you feel the need to force. If you don't feel strongly about anyone just yet, don't worry about it. There could be someone already showing up in the background of your consciousness that you haven't fully realized yet, and it's just a matter of time before they become more obvious to you. But I'd say you probably already admire some artists that you could name today just by doing a little bit of digging. Don't dig too deep or reach too far. Look at what's around you right now. What art did you dig up in your inspiration finding session? Which artists stood out to you most? Or which books did you love as a kid which still capture your imagination today? Do you remember who the illustrator is? Maybe now's a good time to start learning more about the artist behind the art. If you're trying to pin down one or two heroes for yourself, try this. First, go out and find inspiration as per the previous tip. Next, go back and look through your collection for the images that speak most to your heart. Now, identify who the illustrator is and create a new Pinterest board named after them. So I might make a board called Paul Rand. Now, when you make that board, Pinterest will no doubt call up more work by the same artist. So like the first tip, start collecting images by this artist 
filling out your board to maybe 10 to 20 images. And this can help you identify other important information like what kind of illustrations did they make and for which contexts or markets. We'll get more into that in the next tip, but this is where we start building a picture of our heroes and get to know their work and influence more. As you go, see if you can find out more biographical information about them. If they're a more well-known or historic illustrator, they might have a Wikipedia page or a tribute website or even a biographical book. If they're less well-known or newer on the scene, which is totally fine to have as a hero, by the way, go to their website or social media and see what you can learn about them from there. Where did they go to school or how did they learn to become an illustrator? How did they make their art? What is their process? What are their techniques? What principles or philosophies drive their work? Listen to how they talk about their work and even how they carry themselves in their tone. Do you relate to them? Are they someone you feel you could learn from and uphold as an example of how to be an illustrator in the world today? What do you admire most about them? Why do you feel a connection to them? These are just some things to think about. Another great place to discover details like these is in podcast and YouTube video interviews. Look them up in Spotify or YouTube and see if anything comes up. One last thought on this before I move on. In his writing, marketing guru Seth Godin talks about mentors versus heroes. In an ideal world, we'd all have personal mentors who cared deeply and personally about us, who could guide us exactly in the way we think we need right now. But mentors are rare, busy, and probably too expensive anyway. Instead, he encourages people to find heroes, leaders to emulate, whom we can easily find online or in books. He reminds us not to use the absence of mentors as an excuse for inaction. Rather, he suggests that the majority of us will have to make do with heroes, the people we may never meet, but who can still have a tremendous influence on our lives and work. The good news is that heroes like this are plentiful and their work is accessible and free. If you can get a mentor, then absolutely get onto that. I've personally had a few mentors and nothing compares to the influence of someone who knows you personally. But still, my most profound influence has come from my heroes, who are mostly, in one way or another, totally unaware that I exist. The takeaway for this tip is to find an illustration hero or some heroes that you connect with at a deeper level than other artists. Be curious about them. Learn about their work and their life. In the same way that I can say that it was Paul Rand's writing that attracted me to him, you can ask yourself, what is it about your heroes that attracts you to them? We can learn so much about illustration through the lives of our heroes. Also, it's important to remember that heroes may be giants to us, but what makes heroes so relatable is that just like a firefighter or a soldier, they show that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. So the third thing I would encourage you to do is to learn about different illustration markets. As commercial illustrators, our work always ends up being used in a specific way and seen in a specific place, and this is determined by the market we're operating in. Now, at this very early stage in your journey, you don't need to decide which market you want to work in yet. I'll just say that there is a relationship between an illustrator's style and the markets they work in. So the kind of illustration you like exists within a specific market. Similarly, the kind of illustration you would like to do will probably work best in a particular market as well. So what is a market? I like how illustrator and podcaster Andy J. Pizza puts it in his little booklet, The Creative Career Path. And I quote, A market is a corner of your industry where similar creatives make money 
doing similar types of jobs. So let's unpack this for a bit. What does Andy mean by a corner of your industry? Well, in this booklet, he walks you through the different steps to forge your own creative career. And the first step is knowing your industry, such as film, music, or illustration. And then the second step is to choose your market. Well, it's safe to say that our industry here is illustration. So we can move right to the second step. But again, I want to say that for the very beginner, we're not choosing our market yet. For the very beginner, it's just too early. It's just that it's important to know what the markets are so we can start to notice them more. Knowing what the different markets are is important because this gives us a sense of the different specific ways in which illustration can be used. Over time, we can start to get a sense of how our particular way of illustrating could be used. When we know how our illustration can be used, then we know where there will be demand for it. I really love how Andy describes markets, so I'm going to read a little bit more from his booklet. And again, I quote, Think of your industry as a river and the markets as little villages set up on fertile soil along the river. Finding which market your gifts fit into is a powerful way to establish a foundation for your creative career. What you don't want to do is to try to make the river come to you. These little villages are set up along the river for a reason. There is a consistent, predictable, established demand for this type of work. The idea here is that you can't be too fringy where it comes to finding a market for your commercial art. You should know where the non-fringy villages are and start to get a picture of what they're about so you can know if it's where you want to set up shop yourself. You might like super fringy illustration that ends up on places like DeviantArt, for instance, but you have to ask, is there a market for that? If so, then great. If not, then it may take some extra digging to find the markets that will work best for you. Examples of illustration markets include editorial, advertising, retail, corporate, publishing, kids books, comics, and licensing. There are a whole bunch more, but the idea here is that you can start to get a picture of the actual products and places where illustrations end up and even start to envision what the illustrations themselves might look like. If you want to learn more about the illustration markets, there is an extensive listing on the Communication Arts website called 45 Markets of Illustration. I'll leave a link to that in the show notes for podcast listeners, and I'll leave it in the video description for YouTube viewers. Keep in mind what constitutes a market is not an industry-wide standard. You will find a lot of overlap where it comes to industries, markets, and a third category we haven't touched on yet, which is called niches, or as Americans say, niches. Another way to start learning about markets is, of course, going back to your inspiration collection, and especially the work of your heroes, and learning what markets they worked in. There's a good chance that their work tends to fall into just a few specific markets. So when you're looking at a particular illustration, be sure to find out where that illustration ended up. Was it in a book or on a package? Maybe it was in an advertisement? From there, you can identify the market in which it exists. On the flip side, can you identify any markets in which their work is completely absent? For instance, my work tends to end up in a handful of places like picture books, advertising, and editorial contexts, but never in comics or graphic novels. These generally reflect my own tastes and preferences, and also they tend to be more appropriate homes for my style of illustration. So did I choose my markets on purpose, or did the markets choose me? I'd say it's been a bit of both. At first, I was happy to illustrate for any market. It didn't matter as long as I got to illustrate or do something like illustration as much as I could. 
But as I started getting more of a sense of what I liked, both through observing my heroes and understanding what I enjoyed making most myself, I started to identify markets that resonated most with me. A huge one was editorial because I loved how conceptual a lot of the work I admired was, and these happened to be for editorial publications like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, for instance. I also gravitated toward the licensing market, which includes things like greeting cards and prints, because I always loved the idea of having my work exist in physical space. Specifically, I loved working on letterpress printing, which is a very tactile form of printing. And if we're talking about niches, I would say letterpress printing is more of a niche area of the greeting card market. Of course, a huge dream I had always had, even before I was an illustrator, was to do kids' books as well. All of these markets, editorial, licensing, and children's books, were in some sense chosen by me. And this helped me cater my portfolio toward these kinds of clients. At the same time, some projects came to me from unexpected markets, such as advertising, which I hadn't really thought a lot about at first, but which I ended up really enjoying, and I now consider one of my main streams of work. Having a sense of what the markets were in my early days helped me envision what kind of illustration I wanted to do and where I wanted it to be seen. Knowing the different markets for you will give you possible targets to lock into later as you gain more clarity about your own strengths as an illustrator. Moving on to the fourth tip, the next thing you need to do if you want to be an illustrator is learn about the different tools and techniques illustrators use to make their art. While you can use almost anything to create an illustration such as found objects or even photography, maybe you should try learning something more conventional at first. In my style class, I teach how style is very much informed by the tools and techniques used to make it. I also teach how most illustration can be traced back to four traditional art making techniques that include drawing, painting, collage, and printmaking. Even digital illustration tools like Photoshop, Illustrator, and Procreate are designed to emulate various elements of these physical techniques. For instance, you can draw in Procreate using the Apple Pencil. You can paint in Procreate or Photoshop using your various digital brushes. And in Photoshop and Illustrator, you can create work that is very much based on older printing and printmaking paradigms. Now, at this point in time, you don't need to worry about learning how to actually do all the different techniques. Remember, you're at the very beginning. You're gonna need to learn some of these techniques soon, but as we're just getting started, looking for information and inspiration about what to do next, it helps to start learning about these. As you go through your inspiration, especially the work of your heroes, it's time to start asking how the work was made. What specific tools and techniques do they use? What processes do they use to create different effects or styles? If they're from a bygone era, it could be very interesting to learn how they created their illustrations without the help of digital devices. For instance, have you ever looked at certain old children's picture books, such as Petunia by Roger Duvoisin, and wondered how or why the images look the way they do? Like, why are there so few colors? And why do some of the colors look so flat and separate from one another? These were clearly not just painted out on a sheet of paper. There was some kind of mechanical process necessary to create the resulting illustration in the printed book. Be curious about things like this and do what you can to find out how they work. By doing this, you can learn so much about the technical side of illustration, which in turn can inspire you to try new techniques and even influence your style down the road. 
you start to realize that illustration is more than just drawing or painting. It's often more a technical process than you might have first thought. This can help explain why maybe some of the things you've tried to draw or illustrate so far don't quite look professional or finished like the work of your heroes. Of course, illustration is so much more than the tools we use to make them. We definitely need to learn how to have good ideas and learn the elements and principles of design. But the tools are ultimately how these higher order things become embodied. Personally, I think many of us come into illustration because we love the art supplies and gear. I remember as a kid in the 1980s having a book about illustration in our house. I remember loving just looking at the pictures of the different tubes of paints and easels and knives. I also remember my favorite page in Richard Scarry's Big Book of Words, in which the author illustrated all kinds of interesting looking kit. Kids love art supplies. And when we illustrators go into an art store, we are like kids in a candy shop. As you learn about the tools and techniques used by illustrators, take notes on which ones you seem to be most attracted to. Which tools and techniques do you think you'd want to work with first? While you should try your hand in all of them, Knowing which ones you like the most can give you a strong clue of which ones to experiment with first. All right, so my fifth and last tip for what to do at the very beginning is to keep a journal. Go out and buy a notebook or sketchbook and commit to writing about your journey regularly. Pick a time in the day, maybe during breakfast or just before you go to bed and write for just five minutes. It could be a stream of thought or a list of things on your mind. Maybe write one thing you learned today and one thing you'd like to try tomorrow. If that doesn't work, just write a shopping list. Just show up each day and write. I've been doing this for almost as long as I've been able to write. I don't always write about illustration specifically, but I just like to have a place to write down my thoughts. Now, I admit writing has always come easy for me, but I can tell you that being able to express my thoughts to myself in writing has been a lifesaver. In the previous episode, I told you how I experienced a period of extreme depression in my 20s, and it was through journaling that I was able to see my thoughts in a more objective way and think more clearly and even begin to solve some of my own problems. When you can name the root problem, you can start to solve it. Or, as G.I. Joe would say, knowing is half the battle. My habit of writing has been a key way to understand myself, both in what's been wrong, but also in what's been right. Sometimes I would write lists of gratitude or little prayers that helped me see things more positively. But just as important, writing has helped me know what I want and by being able to name my desires, I was able to pursue them with more purpose. Journaling doesn't have to be a big deal. It just needs to be something you do regularly. Whenever you start to feel anxious about not knowing where you want to go or what you want to do next, you have a place to work that out. Ask yourself, what is it that's bothering you or what are you impatient about? Or what questions are you wondering right now? Of course, journaling is not just for working out your struggles. Whenever you feel overwhelmed by excitement about the possibilities, or when you discover an important clue to what you'd like to do next, it's good to write those things down too. Journals are for dreaming. Speaking of dreams, I think that there's power in declaring your dreams out loud and in writing. It's not magic. When you write what you want down or say it out loud, you literally call your dreams into physical existence. The ink on your page or the sound of your words reverberating through your body and bouncing back into your ears off the walls gives your desires a little bit more body than they would have had if they stayed in your head. I know this is a little bit poetic, 
but every tiny thing we can do to push our dreams closer to reality is something. When I think of all the journals I've written since my early 20s, and I have two or three banker's boxes full of them at this point, I know that there's no way I'm going to read them again. But the most important thing is not that I recorded them for my future self, but just in the act of writing out my dreams, my thoughts, my struggles, my failures and successes, I was able to put extra focus on my pursuit. When we write our intentions onto the page or speak our intentions out into the air, things happen. In my personal journaling life, I have journal entries from even further back, from almost 20 years ago, when I first started getting a sense that I wanted to pursue more art in my life. Imagine my journey to being a commercial illustrator today started over two decades ago. And much of that started by being recorded in a red pen on lined paper in a dollar store notebook. Yes, the journey can be very long and winding, but if you don't start taking steps now, you'll never get far. All right, those are my five tips for what to do when you're at the very beginning, or rather before even knowing how to begin the journey towards becoming an illustrator. These tips are all things you can do right now before even lifting a pencil. And in fact, I highly recommend that you start doing these things as soon as you can. These are really about getting to know yourself more and knowing more of what you want. And the more you know these things, the more direction and sense of purpose you'll have moving forward. So to reiterate really quickly, the tips that I gave you today are one, find your inspiration, which means to intentionally seek out work that makes your heart sing. Doing this helps you create a picture of the kind of illustration you love and therefore would probably want to try yourself in some way later on. The second tip was find your heroes. That means to single out maybe two or three illustrators that really do it for you. These are artists whose work you love and perhaps who inspire you in other ways, perhaps through their writing or their life stories. Knowing who we look up to gives us a vision of the kind of illustrators we'd like to be ourselves. The third tip was to learn about the markets. That means to find out where different kinds of illustration exists in the commercial market. This gives us a sense of where certain kinds of illustration can live and where we might want to fit in ourselves. Knowing the markets we'd like to work in will give us more focus as we move forward in our education as illustrators. The fourth tip was discover the tools and techniques. This means to learn about how the illustrations we love are actually made from a technical standpoint. The way an illustration looks is very much determined by the tools an artist chooses and the skills they have in using them. At this early stage, simply knowing the tools can inspire us to want to try them ourselves and can give us clues about which ones we'd like to start learning. And finally, the fifth tip was to keep a journal, which means to have a dedicated book where you can dream and scheme about becoming an illustrator. Every journey starts with a dream and a great way of helping those dreams come true is by writing them down. Every artist keeps a journal and you, my friend, you are an artist. Hopefully these tips will be your guide as you start filling in the inspiration gap. The gap between that spark of inspiration that got you excited about illustration and creativity at first and your first actual steps toward becoming a skilled commercial illustrator later on. My name is Mr. Tom Froze, and those were my thoughts on illustration. You can find links to all my things at tomfroze.com, including my Patreon, YouTube channel, and Skillshare classes. Remember to rate, review, like, subscribe, follow, and tell your friends and all those very lovely things. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. 
I'll see you in the next one.